know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hey, SJWs, are you looking to get destroyed? <laughs> get out of my way. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Give Them an Argument, Logic for the Left by Ben Burgess, Zero Books, 2019. The key idea of this text is twofold. A. It serves as a crash course in logical argumentation to correct the logic fallacy trigger happy logic bros of the anti-SJW skeptosphere and provide those of us on the left with a more sound understanding of formal logic. And B. It uses this basis of formal logic to critique capitalism. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Is this the right one for an argument? I've told you once. <laughs> no, you haven't. Yes, I have. When? Just now. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Didn't. I didn't. <laughs> didn't. I'm telling you, I did. You did not. Oh, I'm sorry, is this a five-minute argument or the full half hour? Chapter 1. The Milkman Fallacy. The Governor's Fallacy. Why logic and leftism don't always mix. Logic and leftism don't mix. self pone Reels over feels, cucks. Strong dog, do you mind? I'm trying to record a video. This chapter gives the readers a background on the online culture war thing that I'm sure my viewers are already pretty hip to. You know, um, Chapo Trap House and ContraPoints and Armored Skeptic and Stefan Molyneux and Ben Garrison and Donald Trump and Richard Spent. Okay, Strawdhog, I think we get the point. While covering this online debate and logic culture war, Burgess gives a definition of logic. He states, Logic is the study of the ways in which the premises of arguments can support their conclusions, or, in the case of arguments that commit fallacies, the ways in which they can subtly fail to support those conclusions. Looking at why the logic bros of the skeptosphere seem to be trigger-happy about logical fallacies, Burgess looks at how logic is typically taught overly mathematical and with obvious and simplistic examples. If P, then Q, P, then Q, not Q, not P, it all seems very concrete, but it's difficult to copy and paste that into a real-world discussion. As Burgess explains, The problem is that learning the definitions of these fallacies is far easier than exercising judgment about when they've been committed. Burgess continues, I've come to believe that the best way to teach this material is to spend a small portion of the unit on teaching students the definitions of a handful of fallacies and the rest of it having them practice identifying them in the wild so that false positives can be corrected again and again. This reminds me of a very interesting analogy given to me by a senior classmate, a peer, a co cohortist. Whatever you call someone who went to the same college as you but graduated a few years before, he said, All classes should be taught like PE. He argued that if PE was taught like most classes, the teacher would show photos of sports equipment, give definitions of sports equipment, explain the history of sports equipment, demonstrate the use of the sports equipment, and then the last few minutes of class would be spent with students interacting with the sports equipment. And so conversely, all classes should be taught like P.E., with the teacher briefly explaining the concept and the bulk of the class time spent with students grappling with the concept themselves. Appeal to anecdote fallacy! Chill out, Straw Dog. Please just wait until you have something worthwhile to contribute. Burgess's argument is basically that, yes, the culture war between the left and the logic bro skeptosphere has soured the left to the subject of formal logic. However, we on the left need to learn how to argue more effectively, both for dealing with the logic bro skeptosphere and also for dealing with our own sectarianism. The left needs formal logic for solving complex ideas with multiple and diverse solutions. Chapter 2. Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings Ben Shapiro vs. David Hume Burgess starts by explaining Hume's law, the division between is and ought statements that you cannot get a should or a shouldn't out of an is statement. You can't get prescriptive claims out of descriptive claims. You are watching a YouTube video right now. That's a factual statement. 
a descriptive claim. However, should you watch this video? Maybe you should, prescriptive claim. I'd argue that this video is informative and maybe even intergaging. I'd argue that, no, 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 you shouldn't be watching this crap. Why are you wasting your time with this commie SJW? You should be watching Cuck Slayer or Rational Big Boy or Reasonablest Bear. Those bros would totally wreck your smooth brain with their high level important ideas. I doubt it, but the point still stands. You are currently watching this YouTube video, a descriptive claim, but we cannot derive any ought prescriptive statements from that fact. Burgess then looks at Shapiro's 11 rules for arguing. Um, actually, it's called How to Debate Leftists and Destroy Them, 11 Rules for Winning the Argument. Fascinating. It, it's a book, isn't it? I like books. L let's look into it. Let's see what this is all about. Hey, it's on Amazon for 99 cents. Let's see what uh, the reviewers think. Arrogant and ignorant. He must think that conservatives are idiots that can't form an opinion of their own. Ignoring science and compassion doesn't make you a better conservative. It makes you an ass. One star. There are morons on both sides of the right-left spectrum, and this book pretty much encourages those on the right to continue being one and paints everyone on the left as equally stupid. One star. I normally stay far away from books like this, but to quote Macklemore, shit, it was 99 cents. The first line of this 20-page book sums it up perfectly. All that matters is victory. Shapiro doesn't give a shit about honest debate. He would rather project his own faults onto the opposition, make baseless claims, and whine about being bullied when called out on his racism and ignorance. Like most on the right, he lacks the balls for self-reflection. One star. Huh. Sounds like a winner. Anyway, Burgess takes this list of 11 rules made by a total logical genius destroyer of weak arguments who is often platformed by major media and taken seriously for some reason. Um, for example, Shapiro's fourth rule is to frame the argument. And Shapiro uses the example of same-sex marriages and argues that rather than debating if it is just or tolerant, conservatives should demand that leftists explain why marriage should be redefined and how this will strengthen the institution. To which Burgess posits, couldn't one argue why should marriage have been redefined to include interracial marriages? Boom. Roasted. And Burgess concludes, Notice that Shapiro, the New York Times anointed destroyer of weak arguments, isn't talking about how to refute justice-based arguments for marriage equality by identifying dubious premises or by showing some flaw in the reasoning typically used to get from those premises to the conclusion that legal marriage should be available to same-sex couples. He's advising conservatives to change the subject. Boom. Roasted. Burgess also destroys Shapiro's arguments regarding gun control, healthcare, abortion, and even addressing Shapiro's famous catchphrase, facts don't, facts don't care about your feelings. Well done, straw dog. After analyzing some of Shapiro's arguments, Burgess brings it back to Hume's law regarding is and ought statements and states, to the extent that Shapiro's point is that it's important to get the factual premises of moral and political arguments right, I agree, and I wish he would do a better job of acting on his own advice. To the extent that what he's saying is that leftists can't reason our way to our policy preferences by extrapolation from unmixed factual premises, this too is correct. To the extent, however, that his implied point is that this is a difference between the left and the right, he's full of shit. Chapter 3, Libertarianism and Logical Fallacies a guided tour of some very bad arguments. Burgess looks at a variety of commonly used fallacies and their real-world usage in regards to capitalism and socialism. First, composition and division and equivocation fallacies. Oh yes, logical fallacies! Okay, straw dog, just listen. More importantly than explaining these fallacies, Burgess follows his own advice and follows up the textbook examples with real-world examples. For example, the textbook 
example of the composition fallacy is that because we can't see every molecule of the Brooklyn Bridge, then the Brooklyn Bridge must be invisible, an obviously ludicrous claim. The real world example that Burgess gives is class mobility. Under capitalism, the left can point to systemic barriers to class mobility, such as systemic racism. No, no, no. Look at Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Jesse Lee Peterson, and Candace Owens. Systemic racism doesn't exist. You're the real racist. No, see, that's the composition fallacy. Hey, don't you fallacy check me. No, Straw Dog, that's the point. Straw Dog, that's the point. Yes, there are small anecdotal examples that make class mobility under capitalism look possible. However, when you look at studies that address society as a whole, that argument doesn't bear out. This is the composition fallacy in action. Think of the composition fallacy as the exception that proves the rule. Ah, I see. Good point. My mind has been changed. Hey, wait a minute. I wouldn't have said that. Shh, straw dog, don't break character. Then Burgess addresses the no true Scotsman fallacy and the appeal to ignorance fallacy when it comes to claims like that's not real socialism and socialism has never worked. Next, Burgess addresses the libertarian anarcho-capitalist concept of NAP, the non-aggression principle. After picking apart Murray Rothbard's definition, Burgess comes away with a reworked definition which goes as follows. NAP. Do not violate someone else's rights over their person or their legitimate property unless you are doing so in a conflict where they made the first move. This causes Burgess to ask, what is considered legitimate property? It's far from obvious what makes an act of original acquisition just. If you're the first person to see some unclaimed piece of potential property, is it yours automatically? Do you need to occupy or use it? If you do occupy it and use it for a while and then you go away for a while, does it revert back to being fair game for new acquisition? Is it yours if you just claim it verbally? Burgess continues, The NAP just tells you not to violate morally legitimate property claims. It does not tell you, it can't tell you, which property claims are morally legitimate. In this way, perhaps the concept of NAP violates Hume's law. It can say you ought not violate property, but it can't discern what legitimate property is. Burgess then refers to begging the question, that is, putting the conclusion into the premise. Typical arguments regarding NAP and abortion and the death penalty and animal rights all commit this fallacy. Taxation is theft because it is. Abortion is murder because it is. The death penalty is wrong because it is. And Burgess concludes, begging the question is bad because it is. Or no, wait, that's not what he said. Begging the question is bad because the purpose of an argument is to give the listener or reader who doesn't already accept the conclusion a reason to change her mind. Chapter 4. A is A. Ayn Rand, Leon Trotsky, and what logic isn't. Burgess starts the chapter by providing a crash course in reading logic tables, or truth tables, or the, the things that look like this. Burgess then discusses three laws of logic. The law of excluded middle, LEM, every statement is either true or false. The law of non-contradiction, LNC, no statement is both true and false. And the law of identity, LI. Nothing can fail to be identical to itself. Like the discussion of the culture war and logic bro skeptics versus SJWs, Burgess goes on to critique Ayn Rand's overly simplistic style of reason and logic, and critiques the left for going too far in the other direction, almost ceding reason and logic to the right by claiming that reason and logic are too cold and callous and devoid of compassion. This sounds simple enough, but it gets pretty heady when talking about dialectics and contradictions in the Marxist sense and comparing that to the law of identity and contradiction in the formal logic sense. Long story short, Aristotle and formal logic looks at the law of identity, A is A, as a pound of sugar is equal to a pound of sugar, and a contradiction is when the conclusion doesn't follow the premise. 
However, with Hegel and Marx and dialectics, there is no live identity because things are always changing, impacted by other things and by their own contradictions. So A is not A because no two items are exactly the same. And to Hegel and Marx, contradiction refers to the ways in which two different things interact with each other through thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, covered briefly in my review of Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. And so things change through the conclusions to their contradictions. Short story even shorter, Aristotle's formal logic and Hegel's dialectics don't disagree, but essentially Trotsky and Rand were talking past each other. Chapter 5, Technocratic Centrism and Inductive Logic, a note on Nate Silver. Burgess starts by explaining that, in between informal and formal deductive fallacies, there are probabilistic fallacies, ways that an argument can misleadingly seem to be inductively strong. And Burgess gives some examples, gambler's fallacy and a similar fallacy known as hot hands fallacy, as well as conjunction and hasty generalization fallacies. Discussing the hasty generalization fallacy, Burgess gives the example of a political analyst comparing Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, and making the hasty generalization that they are negligibly different because they overwhelmingly voted the same way on over 90% of the things they voted on while they were in the Senate together. However, as Burgess points out, let's look at the things that they voted differently on. The Iraq War, trade deals, the Patriot Act, Guantanamo Bay, the bank bailouts, these are big issues that would cause a typical voter to see Hillary and Bernie as vastly different candidates, despite their similarities. Essentially, these fallacies involve arguments that appear logically valid due to fudging the numbers or misleading probability or statistics. Chapter 6, Fallacies to Correct and a World to Win, Logic and Socialist Strategy. Burgess opens by discussing liberalism's long history of selling out radical and systemic challenges to the system. Similar to capitalist realism and its discussions on modern neoliberalism, Burgess states, The fact that so few CEOs are female registers with them as a social justice issue. Millions of men and women being put out of work by deindustrialization, on the other hand, isn't a matter of justice or injustice at all. It's just the economic equivalent of a natural disaster. What this means is that in our modern late-stage capitalist reality, liberal critiques of the system are seen as logical and serious, while systemic critiques, even the Bernie Sanders AOC-style milquetoast critiques, are seen as foolish and utopian. The methods that liberals suggest to fix this contradiction have failed time and again, and always will because they're not actually interested in solving the problem, which is capitalism, because that is fundamental to their worldview. They believe that these systemic injustices are natural and unsolvable, so the best we can hope for is a free market with strong regulatory practices put in place by a vigilant state to keep the market in check. Burgess argues that winning socialism means a convincing a huge mass of people who don't currently think that anything but capitalism is possible, that there even can be a different kind of world, and that they should fight for one, and then b going through an immensely complicated process full of pitfalls and problems in which that enormous group of people figures out together how it can all work. If we want to get rid of the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, much less if we want to change American infrastructure, we have to raise huge costs. That means we have to have large movements. Large movements. Not small militant movements, large militant movements. The small militant movement raises no costs at all. A movement that stays the same size, it doesn't matter how militant it gets. It is not raising costs. A movement that grows, that threatens a trajectory, that says to them, the streets are in turmoil, the next generation is lost, business as usual is impossible. That's a movement that is raising costs that begins to turn their heads. That's the kind of movement we need to build. Postscript 12, Rules for Reasoning. This is Burgess's reimagining of Shapiro's 11 Rules for Debate. How to debate a leftist and destroy them! 11 Rules for Winning the Argument! Okay, straw dog. 
How to Debate Leftists and Destroy Them, 11 Rules for Winning the Argument. Either way, Burgess's rules present a far more cogent and rational view of argumentation. And not only this, these rules are applicable despite your political leanings. Rules like, number one, carefully consider disanalogies. The question is always A, whether the disanalogies are significant, and B, if they're relevant to the point of the analogy. And number three, learn to restate arguments in your own words. By thinking about how you would put things, you can make sure that you're considering and responding to the best possible version of that argument. And lastly, an alphabetical list of logical concepts mentioned in the book, plus a couple bonus ones I couldn't work in. This is exactly how it sounds, Burgess creating a glossary of the logical fallacies covered in the book as well as some bonus ones. He's got all your favorite fallacies here. That's right, all your favorite fallacies folks, got your fallacies here, come on down, we got ad hominem fallacies, we got appeal to authority fallacy, big in the question fallacy, denying the antecedent fallacy, hasty generalization fallacy, and so much more. And Burgess concludes the text stating, Formal logic is a useful set of tools for avoiding certain kinds of mistakes that we can fall into as we try to reason about the world around us. But good reasoning isn't just a matter of mindlessly applying a few easy rules. Thinking like that is how you end up becoming the kind of logic bro social media troll who rattles off long lists of named fallacies in response to everything his interlocutor says. Actually becoming good at reasoning involves careful thought and attention and lots and lots of practice. Conclusion. You're that smart. Let me put it this way. Have you ever heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Yes. Morons. Really? Years ago, I had really gotten into reading books about arguing. I read Don't Think of an Elephant and Talking Right and How to Argue and Win Every Time and other similar books. These texts were far more about framing and forming appeals and referring to resources and understanding your opponents, and less about formal logic. If you've spent any time discussing politics online, from Facebook to Reddit to Twitter to Twitch to YouTube, right, left, and center, it seems like this semi-unformal, semi-decentralized, public, online version of debating ideas has really taken root in the last 10 years. It seems like this style of debate will be with us for some time, and will be a big player in shaping our political discourse. So with that said, if you'd like a crash course in formal logic, if you'd like a contemporary look at how formal logic functions in our modern political discourse, if you'd like a look at critiques of capitalism and the promotion of alternatives using formal logic, then I'd recommend Give Them an Argument. And as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. Alyssa Turner Gibb, Bobby Lean, Kamazot Salter, Cider Shot, Donnie Tiny Hands, Edward Cruz, Emmanuel Vasconcelos Torres, Evan Matthews, Ishwan Da, Jack, Jan Waterman, Jiggly Puffer, Jilly Bean, Callie, Linux Powered Communism, LS, Lucy, Lukalele, Mad Blender, Mara Penguin, My Fake Name, Nick, Odin Sayer, Oleta Notabui, Only Dog Knows, PD Morin, Paint Eater, Pat Ron, Sean Butterfield, Susie O, Tammy Aaron, The Fool, The Surfs, Tokupine, Tony Harrison, Uncultivated Identity, Vera, and Worst Maxi. And if you'd like to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash radical reviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the radical reviewer. Thanks for watching. You fallacy check me. You know me. No, straw dog, that the point. Straw dog, that's the point. Yes, there are small anecdotes.